mess. Now everything I touch, come on, everything I touch, now turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah, glory to God, amen, amen. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to meditate your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask you to shine the light of your word to us today by the Holy Spirit. Help us to see it. Help us to hear it. Your word for us today. In the mighty matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And all that agree with that prayer said, amen, amen. amen. Well, if you... If you've got your family together or if it's just you, uh, grab your Bibles, amen, and let's get ready to dig into the Word of God in the name of Jesus. And I'm just going to continue right where we left off in a series that we've been on, and uh, we're going to start today in the book of Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says, to owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. So we're continuing our series that we've been calling What Kind of Church Are We? And through this series, we've also been looking at what kind of person are you? This is a series about core values. And each and every one of these things are very significant in our lives as a church family, we're challenging them to be significant in your life. The Bible says in Amos chapter three and verse three, God can two walk together except they be in agreement. And so we are taking time to show you, especially if you're visiting, if you're checking out Faith Family Church, if you're looking for a new church home, this is a perfect time because we're showing you who we really are at our core. And today is one of those amazing subjects that I believe that you'll enjoy. So number 14, which means we've covered a lot already. What in answering the question, what kind of church are we? Number 14, we are a debt free church. <laughs> we are a debt free church. And we mean that literally. We don't we don't owe anyone anything but to love them, as this scripture has said. But more importantly, the church is not just an organization. It is the collection of families and the people that make up the church. And what we're saying is the members that are a part of faith family, because this is a part of our core, we believe in being debt free. Yeah. And so notice here in Romans chapter 13, as we dig into this for a minute, in Romans 13, verse eight, he says to owe no man anything. Now, my father taught me from the time I was young that the Bible is the word of God and the word of God is the will of God and the will of God is what he wants for you. And when you do what he wants you to do, he blesses you. Amen? Amen. So this scripture is telling you what to do. He's saying, put yourself in a position in life where you don't owe anybody anything. Now think about that for a moment. In your life, who do you owe? What's in your wallet? <laughs> But it's kind of like somebody said, get your hand out of my pocket. And a lot of times that is because we live life owing. We, 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 I remember the first credit card I got was on a college campus. You know, I, 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 you know, the advice is, is to, you know, start small, build your credit. And, you know, this idea that that debt will help you to succeed in life. But I see something different in the word of God and I choose to live my life. If I see it in the word of God, I want to align myself to it. So when, when God said, wasn't just Paul, but when God said to owe no man anything, was he just speaking figuratively or spiritually? Owe no man anything but to love one another. I think we've taken it often to mean that we are just concentrating on owing love, but we are losing insight into the truth about positioning yourself in life to not owe anybody anything. That's a debt-free life. For example, if you were to take this verse literally, you wouldn't borrow for anything. And that's the kind of church that we are. We are believing right now to be able to buy land debt-free. 
We're be- I got a couple amens on that. We're believing to be, be able to build millions of dollars worth of buildings completely debt free that we'll never have to put ourselves in position to go to a bank to to get a loan for a church van or to get a loan for some equipment or get a loan for some land or get a loan to build a building and you might think man you're crazy you're never going to be able to do listen with God all things are possible to him that believes and I'm challenging you today I'm revealing who we are but I'm challenging you to be this in your life especially in the moment that we're in right now. Think about it. In 2008, you know, the market went silly. I mean, in 2005, the, the, the motor, the, the big uh, motor companies ended up, at, they couldn't, you know what the problem was? They couldn't pay their bills and they needed a bail. Come on, y'all help me now. They needed a bailout from the government because they overborrowed. And look at what's going on in the government. You know, trillions of dollars in debt. And it puts you in a, uh, a financially risky position. God's wisdom is best. Amen. And right now in the middle of this situation, what's going on in our country, a lot of people are filled with worry and concern. Things that are happening with the job. If you didn't owe anybody for your car, if you didn't owe anybody for, you know, your, your, your appliances and, you know, your furnishings, if you didn't owe anybody for your student, your, your, your education, you shouldn't stress or worry, you know, about anything. You know, especially knowing that God's got you, especially when you position yourself. In. So now. I, and I'm just only up for a few minutes, so don't get nervous. We got my kids here and some teenagers here, and we've got a word from our, our youth pastor and our children's pastor. I'm going to, I'm led to do an entire series that's called Get Out and Stay Out, which is a series to teach you how to get out of debt and then how to stay out of debt. I'm going to give you just a, a, a nugget to interest you enough. And I believe this is going to be coming up real soon. I and mean, we, we've got Easter coming and some other things. But as the spirit of God unctions me, I'm getting ready to do a faith family church broadcast on faith plus uh, network. And I'm going to do it on the subject of get out. When you look at what's going on around the world, if the stock market crashes, there are going to be a lot of people that are in dire situations because of debt. Amen. But when you insulate yourself, you'll be in a good godly position. Amen. I mean, my wife and I, we've just experienced several financial miracles. I mean, a thousand dollars two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And then I told about two thousand dollars. Then uh, this one wasn't uh, a miracle. The IRS owed us a ton of money <laughs> from last year. <laughs> I, I think when they saw the return, they were like, that's just too much to give somebody. <laughs> Matter of fact, they, they had to give us more money than we had paid in taxes, you know, because we had a baby. And I was thinking, I need to have another baby. <laughs> had a government, my wife is shaking her head. We got two little kids. You know, she told me two is enough. You know, it's me and you and we'll never be outnumbered. All right. So we, we've experienced like financial miracles, you know, like $10,000 coming to our family. And I give praise and glory to God within the last, you know, three or four weeks. But I can tell you, we, because we believe Romans 13 and 8, a good chunk of that is going to put us within a few thousands of dollars of being completely and totally debt free. Let me say, well, Pastor, you, you, know, you need a new car. Well, well, God's got me. Amen. And this is how we riding right now. But don't worry about that. Don't, don't be moved by what you see. Because the windows of heaven will open and you'll be like, oh, the pastor now. Amen. So let's get into a couple of scriptures and then we'll move on. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7, the Bible says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. This is the wisdom of God. God says that the rich rule over the poor. Notice there's only two classes in this verse. In the country, there's the, the, the upper class, there's the middle class, and then there's the lower class. In the Bible, there's only two classes, the rich and the poor. I believe with all my heart that the middle class was invented by the rich to make poor people think that they, that they got something. But if you, and it got quiet because most of us fall in that category. There is no middle class. There's either the rich and guess what? The rich rule over the poor. 
And, and the inference is, is that when it goes on to say that the borrower is serving to the lender, the poor are the borrowers. Rich people don't need to borrow. They're rich, right? And they end up then, because they are in a place of surplus, they end up in a, being in a place where they can lend and not have to borrow. So notice God's idea is, is not for you to put yourself in a position of servitude. God doesn't want you to be in servitude to anybody. And that's why he said, don't hold, don't put yourself in a position to borrow for that. You got a vacation coming up? Don't put it on the credit card to borrow for that. You got, to, you don't know, want to do something for education? Don't believe for a grant. Believe for a, a scholarship. Believe for a miracle of heaven to come. We serve God Almighty and He is more than able. Marriage is getting into so much trouble because of money. Amen. And I'm challenging you. I know you're connected, I know you're hearing me. And I just challenge you over the next, whenever that series comes, Really dial in because a lot of us, over 70%, not only in, 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 in the house where we're meeting with the teams that are here helping us to minister to you, but most of the people that are listening to me right now are not debt free. That means we're not acting on the wisdom of God as we should. Think about this. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24, Jesus himself said, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other and then he says you cannot serve god and mammon now the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant in other words when you borrow you put yourself in a position of servitude in other words some of us are concerned about work <laughs> we don't go to work because we want to we go to work because we got to Am I right? Why? Because if we don't go to work, then they're going to come get the car. If you stop paying because you don't own it, right? If you don't go to work, they're going to come get the house. Why? Because you don't own it, right? And so, so many are in a position of servitude and they're trying to serve God. And they're, but, but at the same time, because of making decisions about debt, they don't believe in being debt free. Uh, and, and so as a result, they put themselves in position. And so now they're trying to do what Jesus said you can't do. Ooh, glory to God. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. I believe with all my heart, I don't mean to be creepy, but I believe mammon is a demon spirit that's behind debt. He'll seduce you with 39 easy payment. You can get this jet ski. You owe it to your family to buy this timeshare. You can afford it. Let's look at your debt to income. Well, you got enough in there to be able to, and they don't even consider that you should be honoring God with your tithe. Oh, you can, you can afford this bigger house. You can get a better car. You got a room. You just got a promotion. <laughs> I'll end this segment with this. And, and, and this is the number one problem with people who borrow that are believers. And so I want you to hear me because, again, the overwhelming majority of us have put ourselves in a position of, so we're not debt free. We're not doing Romans 13. What if he meant it literally? And I believe that he did. There's some, you know, churches, pastors that don't believe that it's a sin to borrow. They don't believe that it's a problem as it were, as long as it's managed and controlled. Um, God says, I want you to either be hot or cold, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and I know this is a big leap of faith. I mean, we're, we're outgrowing facilities. We need, one of the reasons why I'm standing in my home ministering to you is because we don't have our own building. I mean, the, the, the school system shut us down and that shouldn't be. You know, we ought to be able to call our own shots. And when you own land and you have your own, the, the, the government can't come in and take what belongs to you. Right. Amen. So it's a big deal to take the position that, you know what, as a congregation, we're not going to put ourselves in position abroad. I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care. You know, well, we really, really need. No, God will. Come on. I believe this with my heart. He will make a way. Here's the number one problem with that. Let's look in Proverbs 18, 24. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh close, closer than a brother. Now, one of my brothers is here with me today. And uh, man, you know, when you have a brother, they're close, right? Brother, family member, close. 
But the Bible talks about there, there's a friend that sticketh close, closer than a brother. I believe that people have become friends with debt. And that debt is the friend that when you want to borrow something from your brother, he's like, no, man, I can't do that. You know, you know I'm, not get, I'm not helping you on that. There's a friend called debt that'll stick closer to you than a brother. Listen to me, folks. The number one problem is not seeing debt as an enemy. Some people see debt, and the people that use debt see it as a friend. What do you do with a friend? When you don't have nobody else to turn to, hey, man, can you help me get this? Oh, man, I, I don't have this right now. Can you help me pay for this, this, this education? Can you help me get a car? You know, we, we sit there with the hat in the hand to ask and treating debt like it's a friend. Amen. So that's my challenge to you. Number 14, we are a debt free church. There's more to come about that. And I, I pray that when the time comes that you'll make a hard decision. I'm going to in this series on get out and stay out. I'm going to give you seven big steps that are guaranteed to get you out of debt and, and for you to stay out of debt. Amen. 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 The next thing we're going to look at today before we go is that we are a unity church. We are a unity church. In Amos chapter three and verse three, we know it because this is the series is what it's based on. He said, can two walk together unless they agree? Think about how passionate we are as a church concerning unity. This whole series is so that we could be in one accord. So that you're not a member of Faith Family Church, but don't believe in faith or don't believe in prayer, or don't believe in health and healing or don't believe in, in debt freedom and, and don't believe in other, these other things that we're, we're presenting. When you engage in a serious relationship, you want to make sure that that person holds the same beliefs that you do that you do. And one of the things that is core to us at Faith Family Church is unity. I can remember what one of our assistant pastors, Bron Bryant, five years ago, or almost six when I was ministering on this subject, this message alone was one of the two that really sealed the deal for him to become a part of this church. And we pray that it'll be the same for you. Unity is what this is all about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I'm, I'm, today I'm, I'm ministering to the worship team who's, who's helping me to be able to minister to you. We're all connected together. I'm personally involved with the worship team in the rehearsals and week to week. And they've just, just done an amazing job. And one of our passions in this team and in this church is being in one accord. You know, that, that the tenors and the altos and the sopranos be perfectly joined together with the, the, the keyboardist and the bass guitar and the drummer, praise God, that we become one in unity. And this is what Paul pleads. He pleads with us that we all would speak the same thing. Now, how is it can, that, a, that a group of people can speak the same thing? For instance, I use this all the time. I want to be in unity with my wife. And that if I'm not home and the Kirby vacuum salesman comes or the Hoover vacuum salesman comes and they want her to buy a $1,500 vacuum on these 24 easy payments, right? I want her to be able to tell them, no, thank you. Just like I would say, not interested, right? I would want her to be able to speak. Well, how can you do that? Well, you first have to be of the same mind. When you think the same, you'll eventually end up speaking the same, right? And the third, the third thing on that is to be of the same decision making. In other words, they're not here right now to decide the same way, but our decision making is essentially the same. Praise God. And then the other two, there's five things. Speak the same, you got to think the same, and you got to make the same decisions. But then two more elements of unity is that we be perfectly joined together. Think about what we can do as a church if we were perfectly united together in faith for five or six or 15 or 20 million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Think about what can be done in the spirit of unity. So Paul urges us to be on the same page. 
in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 13, <clears throat> it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking God. And when they lifted up their voices with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. That then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Notice what happens when there is unity. God shows up big. Listen, it ought to be the number one core value of your marriage is to be unity, that two become one. Amen. When you become one, everything becomes one. You become one in name and aim and purpose and focus and direction. You do things in one accord. It's not his, that, and her, that, and that's my, and certainly that's my bank account and that's your bank account. Oh, it got quiet. And, and here's the funny thing, and I'm ministering to you. You're listening to me right now. And one of the big issues in marriage relationships tie back to money. And it comes because I have a vision to do things this way. And, and they have a vision to do things that way. And that division causes stress and struggle and strain. Amen. My challenge to you is to make unity a big deal in your life being on one accord and i'm telling you worship team god has taken us to a new level we've been sensing it we've been believing for it and praying it and what it's going to require is when you and i become one notice it said when the instruments became one with the voices that the glory of god showed up and i'm looking forward to the day that we'll be in worship and praise and the god shows up big when there's unity this is confirmed in John chapter 17 and verse 22. I'm almost done. In John 17, 22, the glory, Jesus prayed, that the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Not only does God show up big where unity is, Jesus prayed for there to be unity. And notice in this verse that he said, I gave them the glory so that they can be in unity. <laughs> Listen, when they were in unity, the glory of God showed up. Jesus prayed that the glory of God would be given to us so that we could be in unity. Jesus prayed for us to have it. And the glory shows up when we are in unity. And then in Acts chapter 2. In verse one, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. Again, the Holy Spirit showed up. So you got God in the midst of unity. Jesus prayed is like, hey, like we have unity. I want them to have unity. And even the Holy Spirit, he showed up when the people were all with one accord in one place. You're there. I'm here. But guess what? We're in one accord. We're connected together. And I'm challenging you to make it a part of the core value of your life. We're making it. We are a unity church. Praise God in the name of Jesus. Think about what will begin to fall on us as a family. Think about what will begin to fall on us in our marriages. Yeah. Think about what will begin to fall on us in our lives as a church when we become one in this way. Matter of fact, there's an example of this and you can play softly. You can play softly. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1, the whole earth had one language and one speech. Notice, they were of the same mind and they were of the same judgment. They would speak the same thing. And the Lord came down, verse 5, to see the city and the tower which the Son of Man had began to build. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing they purpose to do will be withheld from them. This people, because of unity, got God's attention. He said, let's go down and see what they're going to do. And I believe with all of my heart that as we become one in faith, one in family, that God will come down and be able to say the same thing of us. This that this people have begun to do. This which they have set out to build. 
Come on, how many of y'all see us one day being able to build our own fertility? I can tell you how it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Not because of the money has to come out of our pockets. God's going to show up. Now, he's going to reign in our lives financially and tremendously. I believe it with no doubt. But I believe it's going to become we're united in faith. That, that, that the members and the, the visitors won't have to come to the church and say, hey, you know, why don't we borrow? And, you know, aren't we in a financial position to be able to borrow? No, we all have the same passion that there's going to be a philanthropist somewhere looking to bless a, a, a nonprofit organization that's preaching the gospel of Jesus and they just so happen to be or one of our teenagers goes off and becomes an NBA star or NFL star and want to sow their tithe into faith family church. I don't know how God is going to do it. I just know, come on, that he is going to do it not only in our church as a family, but in your family and in your life. Well, did you get anything out of the word of God today? Come on, were you blessed by this service today? My segment is done, but I want to challenge you, those of you that are online, and I want you all to hear me carefully. There's a lot of concern in the church world through what's happening in the coronavirus. Because tithes and offerings are what are normally collected on a Sunday morning. But what if you can't meet? Or what if people don't come out? Well, now, what do we got to do about the giving? Aren't you all glad that over a year and a half ago, we stopped taking a traditional collection and we allow people to just give freely? We, we've got text to give and hopefully they can put that online. You know, text 84321 and um, hopefully they can put that online and be able to show it our text to give number. Amen. Amen. And so, you know, if you want to give, you know, so many of us are already doing that. And we give glory to God, but I, I, I want to pray a prayer of blessing over all of those that have already given. And I want to pray for all other churches that may be struggling financially during this time. Thank God we're in a good position, but I want to pray now. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up our tithes and offerings to you today to worship you with our giving. We are insulated from the evils that befall this world because no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We are insulated from financial ruin because we are tithers. We honor you, not because we have to, but because we get to. So as we present our tithes and our offerings to you today, we worship you with our giving. We ask you to look down from heaven and bless every single one of us. Bless us in our home. Bless us in the church. Bless us on the job. Bless us in everywhere we go. Cause us to flow with milk and honey. Thank you for rebuking the devourer for our sake, that no plague shall come near our dwelling and opening the windows of heaven upon our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our youth pastor is coming now with a, uh, a message for all of the teens. Will you all give it up for all of our teenagers? <laughs> Woohoo! Amen. Praise God. Give it up one more time for all of our teenagers. In Jesus' name. Tell me what you actually did for spring break. But Kirsten's here, so she can tell me later when we can talk and stuff. So uh, we're just going to continue on a little bit more about what we talked about last week. Uh, and we were talking about using this spring break time as an important time for us to be able to grow spiritually, to be able to have this time off, to use it, to cause us to get somewhere further in our lives and not just waste our time. Because so many times... Uh, if we don't plan to do something purposefully, if we don't try to grow, if we don't try to increase our abilities, then we just get worse and worse. And, and you can end up, you might be a teenager now, and you might be in middle school, you might be in high school, uh, and it may be a complete surprise to you, but you could wake up 20 years from now and wonder why your life is still pretty much the same as before. Especially right now with the millennials, they're giving everybody a bad rap. Uh, so many of them are going back home, staying at home, and you don't want to do that. So take your time right now so you can get out of the house when it's time for you to get out of the house. Because my kids are getting out of the house in the name of Jesus. Anyways, uh, so we were talking a little bit about Lent last week. And we're not Catholic and we don't necessarily celebrate Lent. But I wanted to look at it because it's the season that we're in. We were kind of comparing it to 
being able to use some of our time during spring break to have like an abbreviated Lent. And, uh, and we were looking at how we can do that and what Lent is and things like that. So I want to go back to our scripture base for that, and then we'll talk about how we can use it. Uh, we're looking in Matthew chapter 4. Just going to look at the first 11 verses of Matthew uh, chapter 4. And this kind of sets the basis for uh, what Lent is, where it comes from, or, or how we can use it to our intention. So again, we're not Catholic. There's a lot of things that uh, the Catholic faith uh, preaches and teaches have never been Catholic, so I might get a little bit of it wrong. But essentially, uh, we can agree certainly with this concept of Lent, and we can get something out of it if we can choose to uh, participate in it. I kind of like Lent personally, because uh, over in San Antonio, where I lived for a long time and over here, a lot of people give up meat for Lent. They give up the red meat for Lent. And uh, I like fish. I don't give up red meat. But because so many people do in San Antonio and other places, a lot of restaurants will then start to serve fish. And there's more places for me to eat fish. So I enjoy it. I'm glad that they do it. Um, and so that's what I get out of it. So I want to read to you just real quick from Matthew chapter 4. Since we're only going to be doing this for a few minutes longer, I want to read straight through from verse number 1. Uh, to verse number 11. All right, so if you have your Bible on your phone, today you can use it, but you make sure you don't get distracted and go from the Bible over to your Twitter or your TikTok or whatever else you might be doing, okay? All right, so verse number one says, then, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. So he fasted. He didn't eat any food for 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long time with uh, not being able to eat. Uh, personally, I like to eat and I like to eat on schedule. OK, so about the time we're finishing up breakfast, I'm asking my wife, what's for lunch? Right. Even if I'm not with her, I will text her. What are we doing for lunch? Because I want to know now at nine o'clock in the morning how to prepare my mind to eat the next time at lunchtime. So fasting for a brother or a sister like me could be difficult, but it's very important. So he fasted. He didn't eat, uh, probably drink much of anything for 40 days, 40 nights, a long time. It says when the tempter came to, came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So notice that when Jesus got tempted, uh, he wasn't tempted until he wasn't tempted until he was in a, a very weakened state. All right. If I don't eat for 40 days, watch out. You know, I'll be moving like a bear with whatever strength I have. I don't want to talk about anything. I don't want to you know, hear about your feelings or what you've been doing for the last 40 days, because at that point in time, I'm going to want to eat. All right. And don't get in my way. But Satan came to him when he was at a really weak point, when he was really hungry, when he was really off his normal place. And that's when Satan wants to come and tempt you. He wants to come and tempt you uh, when you're not expecting it. He wants to tempt you when you've been distracted by a problem over here. He wants to bring something that you weren't expecting from over in this direction. And that's when we have to be prepared. And when we participate in our fasting, when we grow in our relationship with the Lord, then we can be prepared so that while all this stuff is going on, coronavirus and all this is going over here, Satan wants to bring up something different from the other side. So anyway, Jesus responded with the word of God and Satan was a, that that ended that attack. Satan wasn't able to continue there. Verse five says, then the devil taketh him up to the holy city and setteth him above the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if you are the son of God, cast yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands, they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus didn't fall for it. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shall not tempt the Lord thy God. This time when Satan is tempting Jesus, now he starts to question who he is. Now he starts to say, if you are who you say you are, if you're as good as you say you are, if you're as smart as you say you are, then you should be able to do this. And I got to tell you, especially for uh, men and boys, don't, don't be eager to prove yourself to somebody else. All right. One of the, the points of maturity and stature is that you don't have to prove who you are to anybody else. 
So don't let somebody come up and dare you to do the dumbest thing you can think of, and then you end up in the hospital, right? Many stories have, uh, have had the sad ending of a simple little challenge. Oh, you, you can't do that. You could never do that. Next thing you know, a person is going to the hospital or they're locked up in handcuffs or they have some shameful story that's going to be a part of their life for the rest of their life. Don't let that be you. Jesus answered with the word and he could have said, yes, I am the son of God, but I'm not going to tempt the Lord, my God. In verse number eight, again, the devil takes him up to an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. Now, if we remember at this point, Satan is the ruler of the earth. Because he was given that power when, uh, say, or when Adam and Eve decided to eat the fruit in the garden, when they disobeyed God, when, when Adam did what he was not supposed to do, then power and authority over the earth was given over to Satan. And so technically, this is something that Satan could have done. Of course, we don't believe he would have done it because he's a liar, but he could have, and those things were in his authority. So this would be something that Jesus would have had to consider in his mind. He would have seen all these great places around the world. He would know all the, the great wealth and Satan is saying, look, I'll put you in charge of them. And whether he or not, he was telling the truth. It could be a temptation for Jesus to be in charge of all that. If he didn't know who he was, but for the last time, Jesus said, get thee hence Satan for it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord, thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Bible tells us in another place that you can only have one master. You can't have two. The devil leaveth him and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. So there's a whole lot in there, uh, but to condense it for time's sake, Lent is like a 40 day fast. And as we talked about last week, we wanted to use our spring break to be able to draw closer to the Lord and spend some good quality time starting out at maybe three minutes or five minutes. If you've never done it before, just spending some time reading the Bible, spend some time praying. Uh, for you and your life, your family, those that are around you and doing that consistently over, over our spring break. Now spring break has been extended. So it's like one of those commercials. Wait, there's more. If you get on on it this week, we're going to double spring break. So hopefully you took advantage of that time last week and you grew in your relationship, but wait, there's more. You have at least one more week to get in on whatever it is that you started last week. And so of course, of course, I want to encourage you to continue that time. Don't allow this time to just be dead time and, or time in a dead zone where you're not doing anything. Don't allow, um, just sitting around all day and staring at the ceiling and kind of looking outside and getting on Netflix. And then the day is done and we haven't done anything. Don't let that be you. This is a great time for you to be able to, to grow, to be able to get to the next level. Last thing I think I want to bring up before I let you go again, if you're still there, I hope you're there. You better be paying attention because I will reach through this camera. Oh wait, I can't reach through the camera. Never mind. Anyway, I wanted to remind you as we saw in Jesus responses, the power of the word. All right. When Satan comes to tempt you and you can use the power of the word Satan will do to you what he did to Jesus. All right. When we resist Satan with the word, then he has to leave us. He has to flee from us. But if we're playing with Satan, if we're, uh, as I used to say, him and hawn with Satan, if we're like, well, I don't want to, I don't think I should, um, see to a guy when, when you get into dating, which remember I told you is supposed to be after you get out of high school, but you know, when, when a guy, you know, approaches a girl and, and, and they're talking about trying to be significant others, um, it is an indicator to the male species that a no is not a no. All right. So if you can keep them talking, my man, you got a chance, but you don't need that chance right now. It's not till after high school. Trust me. It's the best time. But if, if somebody doesn't tell you no, then it's possible. It might only be a 1% chance. But like my man said in Dumber Dumber, old, old, old movie, there's a chance. That's all you need is one chance out of a hundred and you can make it work. So don't play with the devil. Don't say, I don't think I'm going to do that today. Don't say I probably shouldn't do that. We say, no, I'm not doing that because that's not right. That's not what the word of God tells me uh, what I should do or how I should live my life. And you shut it down right there and Satan has nothing else for you. He has to go away and leave you for a se season and then he'll try and of course 
and come back some other time with some other thing. So don't allow this time that you have this extra spring break, this extra free time. Don't allow it to be wasted. Build up this momentum. Now you have uh, two weeks that you're able to do it. Use that momentum. Can carry it on. Continue. You don't have to stop next week when uh, hopefully school gets back. And we are praying in the name of Jesus that school is back in session. I rebuke the prayers of any uh, believing youth that school will continue to be canceled. We cancel those prayers in the name of Jesus. And we say that school will be back in session. Let the adult church say amen. 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 All right, so I'm about done with my time. We've got to let you go. Um, but we're not completely finished. We have something for our smaller kids, our fifth grade and down. We have Sister Angela who's in charge of our children's ministry. She has a word for them and us, so we're going to bring her up now. We'll see you all next week, I guess, on the Facebook Live. Have a good week. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Good morning, faith kids, faith preteens. I know y'all thought y'all weren't going to see me today. I'm here. You should be listening in. Tell your parents, if they're not listening, parents, go get them, grab them, let them be a part of this. We have ministry for children today as well. All right. Faith kids, as always, let's do our core values as before we begin. Repeat after me, everyone. I should be hearing you. <laughs> I'm sorry, don't repeat that. I'm telling the kids I should be hearing them. <laughs> I should hear you, children. <laughs> All right, let's say it with me. You're accepted just as you are. We respect each other's thoughts. We are all in this together. God is here. He is your friend. Because you, because you matter. All right, faith kids, you matter. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time that we're able to share with you. We're able to come to speak a word to your children, God. We pray, God, that you open in the eyes of their understanding, Father, that they're able to know you in a better way, that they're able to experience you, Father, on their level, that they would know, God, that you are their helper, you are their creator, you are their protector, you are their provider, God, and that anything that they ask, oh, Heavenly Father, God, you will grant it to them. We thank you, Father, that they recognize, God, that nothing is impossible for them through you, O oh, Heavenly Father. In your son Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, fake kids, we've been talking about, this is so awesome, right? Because we've been talking about in the last couple of weeks, what is the point of going to church? All right, so we, this is so awesome that we've been talking about going to church and we were saying that we do not necessarily have to go to the house, but we talked about the reasons why we go to the house of God. And so we talked about um, in Acts how the believers came to talk to, uh, to, the, to the assembly, and we uh, discussed that believers come together because we want to encourage one another. God tells us that we are to fellowship with one another and that we're to break bread and we already know we love to break bread together here at Faith Family Church, right? We love to eat, right? We want some brisket pasta for the youth. So we come together so we can eat, so we can fellowship with one another. We come together in prayer. So as we've been talking about why we come to church, we uh, also talked about that we come together to help one another, to encourage, to motivate, to lift up each other. And we discussed, youth, if you remember, we talked about that we are the church, that the, the buildings that we go to is not the church, that we are the church. So wherever we are, we're having church. So this is so awesome that we're able to be in your home and still have church. Wherever we are gathered, the scripture says two or three gathered in his name. He says he's in the midst. He's with us. So he's right there in your home. You're able to sit on your couch, sit on the floor, sit at your bed and praise and worship and glorify God and have church. It's so awesome. Again, wherever we are, we can have church. So as we've been talking, we're having church on today, right, youth? All right. So just want to talk about today, and the scripture tells us in First Timothy, 2 Timothy, verse 1 and 7, the scripture tells us that we are not to fear. 
So youth, we want to talk about, we know that you're sitting home and y'all are talking. See, I think kids don't be texting. Kids are texting at five on the phones with their little friends because parents have given them those phones. So they're texting and they're talking to their friends, whether they're on the games, they talk through the games. I was like, they're talking. My style hit me to a lot of things. They're talking on the games to one another. I was like, oh, Lord. So, again, we want to talk about God has not given us the spirit of fear. So, children, you do not have to be afraid. This is a great opportunity as we're talking about being bold for Christ. This is a good opportunity for you to be bold for Christ, to tell your friends, I'm not afraid. Say it with me, children. I'm not afraid. All right, we do not have to be afraid of what's going on with the viruses. So guess what, children? You only got to do what your mom and your daddy and granny been telling you all along. You know what they told you. Go wash your hands, boy. Go wash your hands. They've been telling you that all along. Go wash your hands. So now you're going to say, okay, well, the world said we got to wash our hands. But it's something you have already been told to do. So why do we need to be afraid about, I got to wash my hands, I got to clean my hands. We've been doing that. You should have been doing that, right? All right, kids. We wash our hands before we eat. We just wash out. We go outside and play. We come in. We wash our hands. So there's nothing to be afraid. God has even told us, be not afraid. In the scripture, in... um. Isaiah 43 and 5, it tells us, fear not or don't be afraid. He says, because I am with you. Who's with you? God is with you. He says, you don't have to be afraid of anything. We're not afraid of no virus. We're not afraid of anything because God is what? God is with us. We do not have to fear. And guess what, kids? All over in the Bible, 365 times it says, Fear not. There is a scripture in the Bible for every day of the week. So every day you can get up and say, fear not. There's another scripture. You don't even have to say the same one. There's in Psalms. It's in Genesis. It's in Luke. It's everywhere in the Bible. It says, fear not. Why? Because God's with you. So we're not afraid of anything because God is with us. Fear does not come from God. Remember, we have an enemy, kids. Who is our enemy? Satan. Satan is our enemy. The scripture says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So that's what he's trying to do. Fear is one of his tactics that he uses to bring us, to destroy us, to destroy ourselves, to be killed. So that's all he's doing, trying to bring fear to people. But we are God's children, and we are not afraid. He has not given us that spirit of fear. So I want to also say, children, that just like your parents say, brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Get up in the morning. Did you brush your teeth? Did you brush your teeth? Oh, don't forget to brush your teeth. Did you brush your teeth? So those 365 times that God says in the Bible, fear not, don't fear. Fear not, don't fear. So just like your parents say, brush your teeth, what do you do? Go brush your teeth. So God says, fear not, what do you do? Don't fear. Fear not. Don't be afraid. You do not have to be afraid. So now, as we're being bold for Christ, you can tell your friends, I'm not afraid because God is always with me. He says he will never leave me. He will never forsake me. So kids, stand on that. Believe that. Say it with me. God is with me. I am not afraid. So don't you be afraid because God is with you. All right, so I want you this week as you're talking to your friends, as you're playing outside, don't play too long outside. Don't stay on the game all night long, all day long. Do some chores. Help mom and dad around the house. You got that. We need to do some spring cleaning. Parents, get some spring cleaning going. Get some chores for those children to do. And, of course, I will be sending out some emails and texts to your parents Guess what, children, to give you some work to do while you're on spring break. We don't want your mind to be idle. So we're going to send out some information, some work for kids at every level that they're able to continue their educational growth and what you can work on at home 
so that you do not be idle. So again, cheers, be bold for Christ. Tell everyone, tell your friends, we're not afraid. We're going to wash our hands because mama say wash my hands, not because the world says wash your hands. We're going to do all that we're supposed to do because God says our bodies is his temple. So we're cleaning our hands and we're doing those things to take care of our bodies so that our bodies can be used by Christ, right? That we know we exercise, we eat the right foods, not too much candy on spring break. We eat those right foods so we can be healthy and happy and that we're able to stand strong for, for Christ. Amen. So, all right, children, say it with me as we end our session on today. One, two, three, kids, be bold. Amen. Amen. I trust that you guys have enjoyed service on today. <sighs> we have no reason to fear. Amen. So just a few things we wanted to bring up to date to you. We have a few cancellations. I know oh, so much going on. But for the March 21st event, it's going to be canceled, uh, March into our purpose for the women. And then also for the, um, the Spring Fest, we were looking to have a fish fry that's actually going to be canceled as well. Um, so we will keep you all up to date as to what those additional changes will be as they arise. We want you guys to remember to just follow the instructions that have been given to you. Uh, wash your hands. If you need to stay inside, stay inside. Um, and then do your part, which is what we've all been asked to do. But above anything else, know that no weapon formed against you will prosper. God's word is true, and that's what we want to stand firm in believing. And the Bible says that it will form, but it won't prosper. And so let that be what encourages you throughout the week. The weapon may form, but it won't prosper. I may hear that my neighbor may be exhibiting some symptoms. The weapon may form, but it won't prosper. Amen. We may hear about it. You know, family members may be going through some things. It's not the time to be in the uproar. Be of encouragement. Be the light, the salt of the earth that we've been asked and called to be. And so the weapon may form, but it won't prosper. Be sure to say that. Repeat it through your ears. Let it get down into your spirit. The weapon may form. But God said that it won't prosper. You all be blessed, and we will connect again next time. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.